So I, um, I will ask a lot of questions, but I prefer it to be a, a, like a conversation. So uh, uh, interrupt me if you like or... Uh, right, but... Um, so, well, the first thing, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Juan Maldacena. I'm the Carl Feinberg professor here at the Institute for Advanced Study. And what exactly uh, is, 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 uh, is your field of research? My field of research is in trying to understand the fundamental laws of nature, trying to develop theories that connect uh, space-time and quantum mechanics. And the main objective is to understand the beginning of the Big Bang. Whoa, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you said, yeah, you said the laws of nature? Yeah. Yeah, so um, physics is about studying the laws of nature, so how nature works. Um, through the years, we've learned a lot about how nature works. Um, and currently, we have theories that are incredibly successful. Um, one of the theories is the theory that describes gravity. So it was originally developed by Newton and then improved by Einstein. Einstein gave us the current uh, equations that govern the behavior of space-time. We'll discuss perhaps a bit more what uh, space-time is made of or well, what the theory of Einstein tells us about space-time. Um, and uh, so that's one very successful theory. Um, it explained uh, things like uh, the expansion of the universe, the formation of black holes, this phenomena that before the theory was introduced where people even didn't think about them. Um, and on the other hand, we have the whole set of theories that describe matter, um, the behavior of matter and the structure of matter. And um, these theories were the, the current version world especially the version that is quantum mechanical, uh, started uh, being developed in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and the quantum is very important for the description of matter. It's what uh, keeps uh, matter stable and prevents it from collapsing, prevents atoms from collapsing and so on. And, um, and this theory well, was further developed uh, through the 20th century. And um, it's now come to the, what we call the standard model of particle physics. Okay. It's, um, particle physics. Yeah. So it's basically the, the basic structures, basic constituents of matter. Um, so matter is made out of little small particles that behave according to the laws of so-called quantum, quantum mechanics. Um, what is remarkable is that this list of constituents is very small. So a very small number of particles uh, make up all the matter that we see. Um, really? So yeah. uh, everything is built up from, from just a... Small number of yeah, small, particles. Yeah, of kinds of particles. Um, so we have the particles that uh, the electron is one of them. Uh, you, and then the, we have the particles that make up the nuclei, the nuclei of the atom. Within the nuclei there are some particles called quarks, but they're small little particles. Um, and for most of matter they are made out of just two kinds, um, so-called up and down quark. And then there are some particles that mediate the forces between them. Uh, and the photon or the electromagnetic waves and so on. Um, and then the weak force and the strong force. Um, the strong force keeps the nucleus together. Um, and with, with these particles and these forces, we can describe uh, all of matter. Uh, um, do you know that or you think so? No, do we, well, we know it experimentally. Um, and um, s and uh, the latest experiment was the experiment in the Large Hadron Collider, who, which uh, discovered the so-called Higgs boson. That was one of the missing particles in the standard model. And so now we have a whole set of particles that describes everything. I, I briefly told you about the particles that make up most ordinary matter, but there are, there are other unstable particles, which are similar, but this structure and, gets and replicated a few times. And, um, and well, so now we have a complete set of particles with a logically consistent theory um, um, that uses the, the structure of something called relativistic quantum mechanics. So, so relativistic yeah. quantum mechanics. So it's quantum mechanics plus the principle of special relativity. So uh, we can discuss perhaps special relativity a little more. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so let me discuss perhaps these theories a little more and then yes, we can okay. uh, go on into... Uh, discussing perhaps uh, the more current issues. Um, so uh, first, uh, well, we have these notions of space and time, right? 
So in principle, space and time seem totally disconnected from each other. So we, we have a very intuitive notion of space, while time looks a little more mysterious to us, and, uh, but certainly different from space. And, uh, so the first point I would like to explain is uh, why physicists talk about space-time, why they put these two words together. Why don't they talk about space, temperature, space, uh, I don't know, price of soy or whatever. <laughs> so they, and they talk about these two things. Uh, because the the way you perceive perceive time depends on how you are moving through space. So if you have two observers who are mo moving relative to each other, the two observers perceive time differently. Um, so um, if you have a clock here, another clock that is moving, uh, this uh, the second clock will appear to this observer as moving slower than the clock he has addressed, and the other observer will see the other clock also moving slower. Um, and this uh, can happen because space and time sort of get mixed by motion. Um, mm -hmm. um, this is the consequence of a principle, uh, which is the principle that light, uh, the speed of light is constant for these two observers. This is something that is not totally intu intuitive. So if you have uh, two obs one observer that is stationary and you have a light beam that travels this way, and you have another observer that moves in this direction, Naively, according to your intuition, you would expect that this observer should see the light moving slower, right? Yes. Uh, if instead of talking about the light beam, we were talking about the train, uh, that would be the case, right? Um, but uh, it turns out that experimentally, uh, the speed of light is, is constant. So it is the same for all observers. Oh, really? And so so uh, compared to the train? Yeah, so if, if, if you had, uh, if instead of a train, we had um, a beam of light, the two observers, one is stationary and the other is moving, both would see the light going at the same speed. So the light would be moving this way. And, uh, and this happens because the rate of, uh, well, how time and space are perceived by the two observers is different. So the price you have to pay for this constancy of the, the speed of light is that time is uh, now relative. So the, in the theory of special relativity, the speed of light is absolute, but time is relative. Time is relative to who's measuring it. Uh. Well, I can I, I can try to try to understand what you're saying. So, um, what I hear is that you say that the, the the speed of light is constant. Yeah. So, uh, time is not constant. Right. Time is uh, relative. The flow of time depends on how you are moving through yeah. space-time. So it, it's similar to, let's say, space, right? So space, so if we are standing in space, there is some direction we call forward and some direction we call to our right, right? But if you have another person who's looking in a different direction, what's forward to him and what's to the right is different, right? So it's this exactly the same, but for moving observers. So you have two moving observers, what one calls time and, and space is different from what the other call ti calls time and space. Yeah. Uh, so that's, um, that's why um, it's more convenient uh, to think about space-time as something that is both time and space, and that thing is uh, the same for both. What one calls time and space is different, but um, space-time is the same. Right? It's uh, the universal uh, structure in which particle, particles move. Right? Um, so... Um, the, the laws of physics uh, have to have this um, this symmetry of uh, well the constant uh, constancy of speed of light and the fact that the laws of physics should be independent of how you're moving. And when you combine quantum mechanics and and this principle of special relativity, you get the modern theory of particle physics. Um, well, you you get the structure uh, which is called quantum field theory, and using special cases of this structure. Uh, putting in which particles you have and the interactions and so on, you get the models for particle physics. Mm. And they are incredibly successful and they describe uh, all the experiments that uh, you can do. Uh, so, uh, you raised, uh, in the beginning you raised the, the, the big question. <laughs> yeah. How did the universe... Uh, right, so let me first uh, say a few words about uh, general relativity. Um, so, um, 
according to our intuition, uh, so space is sort of absolute. So, uh, and um, and there is some pre-existing space where particles move and uh, the objects move. Um, that's probably the the theory of Newton we learned in school that planets move and so on. They are moving in some space that was pre-existing, and it's not affected at all by the motion of these planets. So, um, but in the theory of uh, general relativity, what Einstein postulates is that uh, space or space and time, because they have to come together because of the principle of special relativity, they are actually a structure that is dynamical, so it can be bent by the presence of matter. Um, and he further says that the, the force of gravity is due to this uh, bending of uh, space-time. Um, and um, so this is a new, uh, very interesting conceptual idea. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it, it describes uh, gravity as we see it, and it describes deviations from Newton's gravity. Um, and uh, it describes new things that were not known at the time of Einstein, like uh, the expansion of the universe, uh, the formation of black holes in extreme circumstances. Uh, and well, some of its predictions are have now been confirmed, like the discovery of gravity waves uh, very recently, just uh, a week ago, that was announced. Yeah, I, I saw that. W were you excited about it? Yeah, that's pretty exciting and very interesting. Um, Did you know about that this th that they were going to uh, announce this? Uh, yeah, there were rumors that they were going to announce it. But uh, yeah, of course, the experiment had been going for a uh, couple of decades. Uh, yeah. So for uh, a couple of billion years. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, the, the exp yeah, that those the gravity waves were going on for a long time, but uh, the experiments trying to detect them also were. Uh, took a lot of effort uh, yeah. and uh, so that's also again a dramatic confirmation of both Einstein's theories and, well, the, and moreover um, the existence of black holes and this theory of special relativity of, of general relativity well Einstein derived the equations but then there was a lot of research trying to understand the solutions of the equations the physical interpretation of the solutions um, for example black holes were really only understood in the 60s just theor even theoretically um, and then understanding them better then uh, led to understanding what things you should look for in the sky and uh, indeed some objects in the in in the, the sky were recognized as probably candidates for black holes and and now we have this um, this gravity wave detection which appears to come from uh, the collision of two black holes um, the, so the, the, you think so or? well that's uh, what uh, the, the model to describe it we've only seen we, they only announced one one collision probably as they see more will it, it will be become more and more convincing um, yeah, yeah because but, this is uh, the first one but that you it's a question of time that, that more of these uh, uh, you you would hope yeah so that's um that's all about uh, einstein theory of relativity so Einstein's theory of general relativity is a theory where space-time is dynamical it's uh, something that moves it's not a static thing it's uh, an actor in physics somehow it's not it's not the stage on which physics happens, but uh, mm. uh, it is the stage for all particle physics, for all the matter and so on. Um, you have a space-time and then matter moves in that space-time, but also space-time reacts to the presence of matter and moves itself. Um, and um, through, well, in cosmology, this expansion of the space-time is very important. Mm -hmm. for, you know, space-time expands and it cools because of that expansion, so the expansion of space-time is very important for getting to the universe uh, yeah, to yeah, what yeah. it is and uh, the structure of matter to what it is. This expansion uh, is important for, well, cooling the universe and then further the force of gravity creates the structures that we have in the universe, such as galaxies and planets and so on. And um, so it's important for explaining nature as we see it. Uh, but um, Einstein's theory of uh, relativity is in some sense incomplete because it... Uh, incomplete? Incomplete, in the sense that... Um, incomplete in the sense that you can... If you start out with uh, some initial conditions which are reasonable, um, the system evolves and creates so-called singularities. Uh, so you can solve the equations and you find situations where the curvature of space-time becomes infinite. Uh, so this happens, uh, for example, when a black hole collapses in the interior of the black hole, there is a region with infinite uh, space-time curvature. 
so the space time becomes so curved and so uh, the force of gravity somehow becomes infinite there. If you were to fall in there, you would be ripped apart. Uh, uh, and um, the um, we don't we don't have a theory that well the current theories like general relativity and particle physics do not explain what happens uh, in, in that situation. And um, so, and are you looking for the explanation? Yeah, so those are the theories we have. I, I think maybe we can make a small, because my family oh, is okay. coming in, yes. and uh, maybe I want to tell them to be quiet. We were at the point that you were trying to connect yes. yeah. the, the, mm -hmm. the theories. Yeah, so the Einstein theory works uh, very well for many, many things we observed, but uh, the equations themselves fail in cert certain situations. So one situation is when uh, matter collapses in a black hole. So in the interior of the black hole, we get a region with very high curvature. And if you were to fall in there, you would be ripped apart. Um, and the equations don't allow us to, to derive what happens to matter when that happens. And another interesting situation is if you evolve the equations backwards and you try to find out what happened in the very beginning of the Big Bang, also the current theories don't explain, uh, cannot explain what happens. So they are the... the Again, the expansion would be so rapid uh, that um, space expanding so rapidly that you couldn't, uh, you, you cannot um, derive what happens. The, the equations themselves, the curvature becomes infinite, and the equations fail. Uh, so, uh, it, and it, the, the reason, yeah. No, if if I, it, I try to imagine, of course, what's yeah. ins, uh, what's happening inside your head, trying to connect these uh, yeah. theories, what what happened? Well, the the main reason for this inconsistency is the fact that. Um, um, the Einstein's theory is a so-called classical theory, um, which um, is a good theory when sp the, when things are very big. But uh, when basically you are at very short distances, you have to take into account the quantum. In the same way that uh, matter at long distances can be described also classically, but when you go to short distances, you have to describe it using the quantum mechanical uh, description. Space-time is similar. When you go to very short distance in space-time, you also would need a quantum mechanical description. So for matter, when we go to short distances, we go to the atoms, the elementary particles, and so on. For space-time, we should go again to something which would be like the atoms of space-time. And, and what we is think that? that the, well, so we think that if we went to such a theory, we could do this. Uh, we could perhaps understand the Big Bang or the situations which we cannot understand today. If you find the atoms and, of space-time? Um, I, I, uh, I can't define the atoms of space-time. Uh, we're trying to find what they are. Um, um, and one, one idea that is wrong is the idea that there would be atoms at each different location in space and so on. So space-time is not like a like continuum matter uh, because um, one important property that was understood theoretically is that um, uh, when you have the number of configurations in a region of space-time, that number of configurations does not grow like the volume as it would with ordinary matter. Uh, so the number of atoms somehow, whatever they are, of space-time, we know that their number grows like the area of the surface uh, rather than the volume. Um, and so that's a, an interesting property of this so-called atoms of space-time. Um, so by atoms of space-time, I mean, well, basically a vague idea, uh, but I tried to motivate it this, in this way, the search for a theory that describes space-time at the quantum mechanical level, so using the laws of quantum mechanics. The laws of quantum mechanics are uh, laws which are intrinsically probabilistic, so that's the main difference from the laws of classical physics. In classical physics, you if you know the initial conditions, you can then calculate what will happen in the future. Because you, know, you cannot do an experiment, you mean? You cannot no, no, in quantum mechanics you can do experiments, but uh, the result, you can prepare the initial conditions always in the same way, but the results of the experiments will be different. Uh, each time you do the experiment, you get a different answer. <coughs> and all you can predict according to quantum mechanics uh, is not the precise answer of the experiment, but the probability distribution for um, for, for the different answers. So you so you doing an experiment is like flipping a coin. And 
you can calculate and you can say, well, maybe I'll get 50% one, one result, 50% of the time one result and 50% the other, or maybe it's uh, 30, 70 and so on. And quantum mechanics allows you to calculate those percentages, but uh, quantum mechanics doesn't allow you to give definite answers to some questions. Mm. Uh, and it is intrinsically this way. So, we so but that's a, that's, a, that's a rather a big question you ask yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, besides the part that, that you are a this scientist trying to research mm -hmm. this, yeah. I'm also interested why, why is it you asking this question? So why, what's your, um, uh, wh why do you ask this question? Why do you do this? Well, I, I certainly I'm not the first to ask this question. So this question was asked uh, many years ago. Um, probably Planck was the first to realize that there was a connection between the quantum and uh, and gravity, and at some point uh, gravity would fail and calculated what distance scale it would fail. So that was uh, maybe a century ago. Um, and um, since then, people have had various ideas. Think were thinking about this problem, um, and um, and it's a problem that is hard to access experimentally directly because this distance at which uh, the quantum is important is super tiny. So it's much smaller than the smallest distances we can see today with accelerators. Um, um, so the, I'm part of a group of people who um, are trying to investigate this from the theoretical point of view, trying to find the structure, a mathematical theory that would put these two things together. And, um, we are trying to do something similar to what Einstein did when he uh, joined special relativity with Newtonian gravity. So he realized that the gravity theory of Newton was not consistency, consistent with this idea that the speed of light is the maximum speed of propagation of signals and that it should be the same for all observers. And putting those two things together, he managed to create a structure, the structure of general relativity. So here we are trying to replicate that and from theoretical points of view, try to find the connections between the quantum and space-time. Uh, and and uh, are you sure you are going to find the answer? Or do, are you no, sure we are, you're we, on we the are, right No, we are not 100% uh, sure, but we are confident that uh, we have a high probability. Uh, and, uh, and the question is so interesting that, uh, that we should try to investigate it. Uh, um, but, but, but you know you're on the right path. Yeah, so what gives us confidence that what gives us some confidence that we are in the right path is that um, well, we're not uh, investigating this in the vacuum or without. The, we, we now have some very concrete theories. Uh, one, well, the, the nicest one is the theory of string theory. Um, that is a theory basically under construction, but that works very nicely in some situations and that manages to join uh, the quantum with space-time. And it's a theory under construction and a theory uh, which uh, is continued to be developed and we are it's trying to understand theory. it. Yeah, string theory, yeah. So it, it seems to capture, at least it seems to connect the quantum with space-time in a very interesting way. Uh, and by investigating a string theory, people have found very interesting mathematical relations that are true in mathematics. They found the connections between different physical theories, um, for example, between the theory of strong interactions and some theories of space-time. And the, the fact that uh, these connections were found gives us some confidence that uh, at least the structure that we're investigating is interesting and, yeah. and, and rich and it, it could be the answer to, to this question of quantum gravity, which is really the main question. Uh, we are we are trying to answer. And you are in a group of people who uh, who are on the same level uh, uh -huh. th theoretically. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, but how was it for you to? Now you have to explain it to me, and mm -hmm. I I don't understand. So you have to transfer your thoughts or your ideas to to people who don't understand because it's so difficult, even for you, for, for mm -hmm. yourself it's difficult. How, how is that? Um, well, for us it's, it's difficult to find the equations and to... But um, I think what I'm trying to convey is the problem we are trying to understand. And I think the problem is understandable. It's, uh, 
I mean, it's just joining two theories of physics that are out there and putting them together. Um, so they are not completely compatible with each other. And in the history of physics, when there were two kinds of theories that were not quite compatible, and you find the structure that puts them together, it might be the right structure. Uh, and this theory might be the, the string theory. Yeah, so string theory is the main tool and the main uh, thing that we are investigating. And we think that um, that it, it is, if it's not the right structure, it's probably close to the right structure. It could be a stepping stone to the right structure. For a lot of people, we, we, the string we, theory is mm -hmm. ununderstandable. So, uh, but, mm -hmm. but you all have to understand the string theory just to, to use it as a possible... Uh, yeah, yeah. So string theory might, might sound complicated, but I mean, it's, it's something that someone who's doing his PhD in physics can learn in a, in a year, a couple of years. So they can a couple of years, theory. and then you know the string yeah, theory. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so so <laughs> um, maybe I can learn but, it in you know, one minute. Can you explain to me what you, is you, it? you know, there, there is, it's like playing the piano, right? You're, you're not going to be able to play the piano in five minutes so it's, I mean someone can tell you oh yeah you have to press keys and so on but you you won't be able to play the piano or to, to produce nice and, music and it sounds awful and so uh, here also it takes a while to get familiar to familiarize yourself with the ideas and and, and one reason it's hard is because it, it, you really have to learn a lot of the physics that precedes, precedes it you have to learn well general relativity you have to learn well um, particle the theory of interacting particles, and and well, you have to do this. So isn't it a f isn't it a fact that <coughs> if, if uh, different people from different backgrounds mm -hmm. uh, come together and uh, discuss this th string theory, mm -hmm. that in the event that they all know what you are talking about or understand the string theory, yeah. doesn't make it then true. No, I mean, what makes a physical theory true as a physic theory of physics is comparison with experiment, right? Um, but but, but if, you all, if you all understand string theory and you, and you think mm. it's true, you understand what it means. It uh, took some years, yeah. but the different other people also took some years and they understand string theory. Well, string theory today is a mathematical structure. So it's a, a mathematical structure which has some physical interpretation, but we don't yet know whether it's the right theory of physics. We think it's in the right track, and we, we are motivated enough to continue studying it. We, and, um, but, but, you know, that doesn't make it true. That just makes it a very interesting mathematical theory. Uh, and can you and explain to me uh, what is meant by the string theory? Um, well, mainly string theory is a theory with some laws and so on that this can describe uh, space-time at the quantum mechanical level, so using the loss of quantum mechanics, and that it reduces to Einstein's theory for big distances. Um, that's uh, its main advantage. Now, maybe you are asking, why, why is it called strings? Um, well, this comes from the fact in one of the old versions, well, this comes from the fact that in one formulation of the theory, you have little tiny vibrating loops of, uh, of string. So, Part, instead of having particles which are point-like, as we have in theory of particles, ordinary particles, uh, the elementary objects are little strings, um, one-dimensional objects. Um, and that's uh, and using those, uh, you can describe uh, ripples of space-time interacting, uh, or those gravity waves that we discussed before in the experiment, uh, when they interact in a quantum mechanical way, um, they can do so uh, in a way that is, uh, does not generate ni any inconsistency. Um, ah. So, uh, 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 is there a theory of your own which you are investigating or researching? Well, I've been uh, researching a, a certain relationship between uh, string theory and particle physics. Um, so it's a relationship which is part of these connections that I was describing before that uh, string theory led to. And so this is a connection between uh, theories of, um, of gravity in the interior of space-time and a theory of particles on the boundary of space-time. So in this relationship, the idea is that the, the so-called atoms of space-time of the interior are like particles on the boundary. Uh, that's roughly one way to say it. Um, Another analogy people 
make sometimes is the idea of a hologram that you can. A hologram is a two-dimensional um, pl photographic plate that, when you illuminate it with light, you see a three-dimensional picture. So the idea is that um, you can have the dynamics of these particles on the boundary of space-time, so far away, can uh, have an alternative description as objects moving in the interior, subject to the force of gravity. Um, so the so atoms of space-time are uh, uh, reflected or projected? Yeah, so the, the real atoms would be on the boundary, uh, the real elementary particles, uh, let's say. And uh, the, then we get some effective description, approximate description, in terms of a uh, space-time in the interior. Um, so in this picture, space-time is uh, emerges as an approximation, as an uh, approximation due to the dynamics of uh, lots of particles, in the same way that um, properties of microscopic objects come from uh, similar approximations, like uh, I know the viscosity of water or just uh, the behavior of water waves and so on, comes from the collective motion of many of the constituent molecules, right? So, um, um, but, but can you explain to me how it works, this, uh, this hologram, again? Mm -hmm. Maybe as simple yeah. as possible. <laughs> yeah, so this idea is the idea that um, you can describe gravitational physics or dynamics of space-time at the quantum level, which is something we don't understand too well how to do it, in terms of a theory of particles that lives on the boundary of that space-time. The theory of particles is very similar to the theory of particles we use for particle physics. So, um, or some similar to the theories we use even in ordinary quantum mechanics. Um, so uh, that's uh, this connection, and it connects, uh, for example, black holes to thermal systems of particles at finite temperature. Um, and uh, and it, if you assume, so it's it's a kind of it's a conjecture that these two things are related, um, and it's a conjecture that. Uh, People have worked a lot on, and they found lots of evidence that it is correct, um, at least in very specific cases. Um, so it's a conjecture that leads to mathematics. It's a conjecture between two, let's say, mathematical theories. One is the mathematics of string theory in these space times, or quantum mechanical dynamical space times, as described through string theory, and uh, ordinary theories of particle physics. Um, and so in many cases, we can approximately describe each of the two sides and then check mathematically that they are correct. Um, and, uh, but the idea is, is to understand this further, to understand better how space, what this implies for space-time and how to build better theories of space-time. Uh, in particular, how to solve all, some of the problems we have with black holes. Um, um, so black holes are understood reasonably well with the theory of Einstein's, uh, with Einstein's theory of relativity. But uh, black holes have uh, also give rise to some quantum mechanical effects. Um, well, more precisely, if once you take into account quantum mechanics, uh, black holes uh, can start to emit a kind of radiation that Hawking discussed, uh, discovered, and he discovered this theoretically, and it's called Hawking radiation. And so this implies that black holes, uh, they form, and then they start emitting this radiation, so they emit a kind of soft glow. Um, and just to to highlight how surprising this radiation is, um, so black holes were called black because they don't emit any light. I mean, everything that falls, everything that goes in, has to fall in, and nothing can be emitted. Can get out. It. Can cannot get out. But this radiation is something that is somehow getting out. Um, and so you can even have the paradoxical situation of having a white black hole. So if you had a black hole, which is tiny, very tiny, uh, the, size, uh, the size of uh, the wavelength of light or the size of a bacterium, roughly, roughly speaking, uh, that black hole will look white to our eyes. Um, now, these black holes don't form naturally in nature. So the black holes that form naturally in nature are very big and have a very low temperature. But if you could form such a tiny black hole, theories predict that it should look white. So here you see that a little bit of a conflict between Einstein's theory of relativity, the beginning of a conflict, you see. That one says that it should be black, and the other one says it should be white, right? White <laughs> <And> then, hole. <laughs> yeah, this white is different from, yeah, this is different from what people call a white hole, but this is, uh, this is a white black hole. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, 
And here you see the beginning of some slight conflict between the two. And if you go a bit uh, deeper in, um, there are some laws of, let's say, thermodynamics that, that should apply to black holes, to, to any object that emits uh, thermal radiation. This radiation is thermal, mm. so it gets emitted at a certain temperature. Um, and that's why you need it to make it very small to make it look white, because the temperature becomes higher the smaller the black hole is. So small black hole is mm. hotter than a bigger black hole. And um, so as you make the black hole smaller, it gets hotter. Right? And if you apply to it the laws of uh, thermodynamics as we usually understand them, uh, they seem to hold for such black holes. Uh, mm. But they, are, they seem to be in some conflict with uh, another fact we know from general relativity, which is that if you solve the Einstein's equations in a black hole, there is a surface that we call the horizon, which is a surface basically dividing the outside and the inside. Uh, it's an imaginary mm. surface. It's not a real uh, surface. Uh, um, it's kind of point of no return. So if you, if you cross the horizon uh, in the interior, you cannot send any signal to the outside. So, um, or, and you, uh, you cannot even escape. You will be doomed to fall into the singularity. But you, you don't feel anything when you close, cross the horizon. So it's a perfectly reasonable surface. Uh, <laughs> and um, so that's what the Einstein theory predict. Um, and this fact seems to somehow be in some conflict with this thermal properties of black holes. And how to fully resolve this conflict okay. is one of the things I'm, well, I and some other people uh, are working on. And, and is, the, is there something that you can call your life work? Can you... Can you well, I would say that uh, it's been mostly investigating this, uh, this relationship between the, bulk, the, the interior and the boundary, um, and also trying to understand these puzzles with black holes, uh, these problems with black holes, quantum aspects of black holes. And, and, but, but, I mean, do, do you... Uh, um, is this, is, this, is this like your life, researching this, or is it just a, a job? Oh, well, it's a, no, it is a kind of, it's a passion, and I would like to really find the problem, and find the solution to the problem. And, um, yeah, it, uh, well, I hope uh, it gets solved soon. <laughs> Are you close? Um, yeah, we seem to be close. But, uh, <laughs> hopefully, yes. And what I try to, to imagine is, is uh, because it's also theoretical, um, you, you, must have, you must have a big imagination. Mm -hmm. w w when you think about it, what do you see? It, it, is it, and, not, and I'm not, I don't, don't want you to explain uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the theory, but, mm -hmm. but how do you represent this in your, in your head, in your brain? In, well, in we, colors we, or in, in shapes or in... in um, yeah, probably in terms of... Uh, but we, we have ima we imagine formulas and their properties and uh, we make a little mental image uh, for for these formulas. We, for example, already for Einstein's theory of relativity, you have to imagine space-time as some kind of membrane and so on. But how do you imagine uh, that? Well, I imagine it uh, as a, for some exact classical space-time, for example, as a membrane and a quantum one, a membrane that is fluctuating. And those are the kind of mental images that we... I'm sorry, before. again, a membrane? Well, space-time is like a membrane, right? Uh, that has certain shape and has some dynamics, so the shape can change. And if you get very close, this membrane has some oscillations and and some structure, right? And that's uh, what we have at short distances. I mean, yeah, that's a, a picture that is more or less uh, standard for how to think about this. Uh, now, one of the interesting things that we've uh, been um, trying to understand and we, uh, we we are not well many people have begin began to notice is that there is some uh, connection between a certain property of quantum mechanics called entanglement uh, so entanglement is a is a funny property a funny kind of correlation you can have in quantum mechanical systems uh, which are in some sense stronger than classical correlations um, and so before we discuss the the fact that in 
certain quantum mechanical systems, you cannot predict the answer to a certain experiment, right? So you might um, you might sometimes find 50% chance of one and 50% chance of the other answer. But you can have systems where you have two particles and they are separated and you do an experiment here and you have 50% chance of the outcome, of each outcome. And you can do another exp experiment here and you have, it's again, 50% chance of any outcome. But it might turn out that the outcomes of the two experiments are correlated. So let's say you, the experiment is like flipping a coin, right? It comes out heads here and then it also comes out heads here. And if it can, comes tails here, it also will come out tails here. So they're perfectly correlated. That's an example of a classical correlation. Um, Entanglement is the fact that uh, you can also measure another property at the same time, so of this coin, which is not heads or tails, but let's say the color. Well, this is a bad analogy because the property is quantum mechanical that cannot be measured at the same time as the original uh, property. Right? That's one of the features also of quantum, mechanic, quantum mechanics, that sometimes you can have two, um, two properties um, which uh, you cannot measure at the same time. So. You can either ask this coin whether it's uh, heads or tails, or whether it's, say, it's black or white, but you cannot ask uh, whether it's black and whether it's, tail, whether it's heads or tails. This is not perfect analogy because our classical variables are not of this kind. They are not uh, sort of mutually incompatible. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can do that uh, with this quantum, let's say, properties. And again, uh, you can have two particles so that um, uh, if you now measure not only whether it's hairs or tails, but also black or white, you have the same feature, the same correlation, perfect correlation with the other. And that's some kind of correlation that is not possible in classical physics, but it's possible in quantum physics. Uh, and we think that... Even though there's a big distance. Yeah, even though that there is a big distance. But uh, again, with classical correlations, you can have these correlations because the two you prepare the, the, the two coins first and then you took them apart and then you looked at it. So in classical physics, there is no problem with this correlation. What's, uh, sub what is interesting is that you can have a correlation between obs observables that um, are mutually incompatible locally, right? By compatible, I mean that either you measure one or the other, but nevertheless, uh, you have the correlation. Mm. Um, and um, so entanglement was a surprising property of quantum mechanics when it was first noticed. Uh, it was noticed in a paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen um, in the 1930s. And they, uh, and then, well, this was a property. And now it's been, now it's a quite central notion for quantum information theory, and people are using it in more practical ways um, oh. uh, to build. Uh, I mean, it would be essential for building quantum mechanical computers and so on. But it also seems to um, to be connected with the connections in space-time. So things that are closer together in space-time are more en more entangled with each other. So um, in some sense, when you have um, the the quantum field theory vacuum, so the vacuum in uh, in the theory of particle physics, if you were to split it in two parts, um, the fundamental degrees of freedom or quantum variables that uh, describe it are um, quite entangled uh, with each other. Mm. Um, and we think that in some circumstances, if you take two separate systems and you entangle them very strongly, so you could also generate some kind of quantum connect, because you can generate, sorry, a geometric connection between them in some cases. Oh. Um, so in some sense, uh, um, through the entanglement, um, is connected to, to the connectivity of space-time. So you can, yeah. Well, I, I want to um, try to uh, get back to the beginning again. Yeah. Because, uh, because it's so, it's rather difficult. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, now you told me a lot about it. So yeah. I try to recapture yeah, sure. a little bit, mm -hmm. um, if I'm right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I would, I would like to ask you, to give uh, definitions of the of the the, the, the ingredients, okay. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. uh, but definitions for uh, normal people, okay, cool. like yeah. what is time, what is space, and what mm -hmm. is um, uh, re relativity. Okay, good. So let's start uh, with time, right? 
So time is what the clock measures. So now this sounds like a circular definition, but um, of course what's not obvious is that different clocks made in different ways measure the same time, right? Um, but it turns out that if you have a, a different kinds of clocks and you make them, they will all measure the same, they, they will measure the same, they will give the same answer, and that you can synchronize clocks and they stay synchronized and so on. Um, so there, it looks like there is something that is being measured by these clocks. So this something is the abstraction we call time, right? We have the time we feel psychologically, which is not the perfect clock, but mm, certainly agrees with um, with more precise physical clocks. But all clocks that measure time are made out of physical particles, and, uh, and that's how we measure time. How, that's how we define it. Um, and so it's an abstraction that does that is the thing that all these clocks are measuring. What is space? So, uh, well. Space is somehow the the distance between two, the, the, the let's say the nothingness that exists between two objects. Right? Uh, um, now, I mean, it's what's missing when you go into a crowded bus. Right? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, and so that's uh, space. And now, what is relativity? So let's first discuss special relativity. So before, when I was discussing time, I said that time that all clocks measure the same time. And that is only true for clocks that are stationary. So if you have a clock here and a clock here, and both stay at rest relative to each other, then they will measure the same time. But if you have a clock here and another clock moving, right, they will measure a different time. Um, and relativity, so special relativity, that tells us how different is this other time that the, measure, the clock measures. Uh, so it's a simple law for how to find out what yeah. that. Uh, and so the theory of relativity is the theory that postulates the, the that the speed of light is constant. It's absolute. So, uh, so he could also have called it absolute something. Mm. <laughs> What's relative is time, but yeah. that doesn't mean that everything is relative. And in, and and this and this reasoning, what is light? Um, well, um, well, you could replace light by other uh, things like gravity waves also propagate at this speed. So more precisely, I should have said it's the maximum speed of propagation of signals. Um, so the idea is that there is a maximum speed for the propagation of signals. Uh, and it so happens that light propagates at this speed. If you had a massive particle, it will generally propagate at the lower uh, speed. But if you try to push a massive particle to move it faster and faster and faster, you could not make it move faster than this maximum speed, which uh, it also coincides with the speed of light. And that's why it's absolute. Yeah, yeah. And different observers would measure exactly the same speed. So, uh, can we go? Why do you want to know, and why do you want to, to have an explanation for how life started? Well, it's, it's not an explanation about how life started, but how the beginning of space time started, right? Um, how um, how time originated and what happened in the beginning of the Big Bang. And I'm trying, we are trying to understand it because uh, that's something we don't know. So science is always about uh, pushing the boundaries. And we don't, it's not, it's not just the fact that we don't know how it um, happened, but even we don't have a in theory that is self-consistent that could describe it. So um, we are even trying to find th theories that could in principle describe a Big Bang, then we'll have the problem of finding where that's the way our Big Bang actually happened. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's why we think that this problem may be solved by thinking about it and then uh, finding the theory and then perhaps making some new predictions that we could test experimentally. Yeah, but, but all the time the same question arises again, but w what happened before the Big Bang? Qu questions like that. So, so right, right. how do you deal with this? Uh, almost um, impossible well i mean the, the, the idea is to make a theory and uh, maybe the theory that you can make a theory which um, which had a time before uh, maybe you can make a theory that where time actually starts in the big bang um, and does not have any meaning before it so that the question doesn't have a meaning and we don't know what the right answer is so 
Uh, that, that's what we're trying to find out, whether it's constant. So people imagine, oh, maybe there was a time before and somehow we went through the Big Bang. But uh, these are just words. There are no self-consistent equations that can, uh, where you can have such a thing. Uh, and if, if you try to make a theory where, okay, the universe was contracting and then expanding again, for example, they violate some uh, principles that we think are, should be true in a theory of quantum gravity. Um, so when, when did you s yourself ask this question for the first time? Um, well, I guess as I started learning more about uh, physics, I started uh, recognizing where the boundaries uh, of physics were. And there are boundaries of physics in many directions, in the direction of very complex systems, in, in very different directions. But this is one of the directions in which we uh, see a boundary. And so I wanted to go to the frontier in this direction, right? <laughs> yeah. So I guess the physics are trying to always expand, the, push the frontier further and further away. So <laughs> right now you are at the frontier? Yeah, this is certainly one of the frontiers. What do you see when you look ahead? Um, well, I see confusion. I, I see uh, lack of understanding. Uh, and um, I, uh, the idea is to find patterns in, in this uh, confusion and to move forwards and to understand things that we currently don't understand. Do and you feel small, some bit by bit. So usually you, you advance a step, uh, one step at a time and you can get a little further and a little further. And, uh, Do you feel something like a, a competitor or some, so, so, some, something like a, a, a challenger or t t something which challenges something somewhat, uh, somebody who, who challenges you to, to uh, 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 try to find me, something like that. Um, yeah, certainly we were trying to find this answer and we really want to get the answer. And um, sometimes you feel, oh, maybe it's close, but then you realize, oh, maybe they made a mistake. And then you, uh, and it, it's all happening also uh, not personally, but within a community of researchers who's trying to find this. And, and you criticize the ideas of others and others criticize your ideas. And in this way, you make progress because it's a, it's a difficult problem and you need um, you need insights from many people that, can, that know different aspects of, uh, of theoretical physics or physics in general and can inform this. Is this it question. possible to think of something like an entity who is on the other side of this frontier or maybe not an entity but but uh, well there might be another intelligence in our universe who has already figured out this it has figured this out and has uh, understood these problems uh, but uh, at least it's not known to us but <laughs> but ma maybe yes yeah, uh, but 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 i uh, when you uh, when you are on a on a frontier like like uh, mm -hmm. like uh, the, the the West was one here in the United States, mm -hmm. and you don't know what's out there, but you go there and you find mm -hmm. things. Right. But 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 it's because you didn't know right. that there were Indians and that and there was another coast uh, right. and another right. ocean. Right. Um, so there is some awareness on the other mm -hmm. side of the frontier. Mm -hmm. uh, only we don't know. So what kind of awareness is on the other side of your frontier? Um. Well, by awareness, you mean the Indians. Well, that, that you're putting too many anthropomorphic things that are not uh, were not present in our <laughs> in this discussion. I mean, uh, we are the no only known uh, intelligence in the universe, the only known being that is trying to understand the universe. Uh, so uh, we are just expanding. When I say expanding the frontier, it's just understanding equations better, understanding laws of physics better. But these entities are very simple things. They're, I mean, one of the features of physics is um, that I think it's amazingly interesting is how simple the fundamental physics laws are. Um, of course, it, you might say, well, if it takes a couple of years to understand it and you need to study or maybe more, maybe you need to understand, study physics for five years to understand them. Why are you saying they are simple? But they are simple in the sense that the actual laws that govern their motion and so on are really simple. So the, you don't have to come up with rules and lots of books and so on. Uh, it's been very different than the, the laws that you find in, you know, the, the, the senators and uh, 
people produce where there are exceptions here and there and there is, uh, you know, <laughs> here there is a very simple statement and uh, this is followed by everything we know. So, and it's true. Uh, and it, well, it's true to the extent uh, we suddenly have been able to experimentally verify. And, um, and the statements are simple. They're in a language which is unfamiliar. They're in a language which takes a long time to learn. And that's what takes a long time. It's just to learn this language in which to formulate the laws. But once the laws are formulated, they're in a very simple way. Uh, once you learn which one language. do you like the most? Well, I think the general relativity is probably the most uh, beautiful theory uh, because it uh, translates physics into geometry. And uh, this is a very nice theory. Um, and uh, we, we don't know how to make such a beautiful theory out of quantum mechanics, let's say. Uh, but maybe it will exist at some point. If, uh, so, and what, what for, for you as a, uh, as a child, for example, what, what what led to this uh, this position you have right now uh, on this frontier? Where did it start? Well, I as a child I was watching my father, for example, uh, fixing the washing machine and trying to uh, learn how to do it myself. And I and by again understanding how everyday objects uh, work, like the, mach the washing machine, the car, uh, little radio, and so on. Um, uh, you learn a little bit about technology and how technology exploits the laws of physics. Um, and that got me interested in understanding the laws of physics, which underlie technology, and seeing how far they are understood and what, uh, what things are known, what things are not known. And, how and did you do that to... as a child? Well, as a child, I was mostly interested in technology and uh, how things worked. Uh, and um, then when I was in high school, I was a little more interested in the laws of physics and chemistry. And, and but what did, you do, what did you do to, to explore as a child? Well, mainly think, taking things apart and, and seeing how they worked. Uh, that's basically the process. Yeah? Yeah. And putting them together again? Yeah, yeah, just taking them apart, putting them together. It's just learning to fix uh, household uh, appliances. Yeah, that's practical, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, if you... Uh, if you try to find out what's, how it's made, uh, and why it works, of course, right, I right, guess. Right. Yeah, I was always curious in understanding how things work. I mean, how does the TV work? How does uh, you know the radio work? What's the actual principle it uses, right? And do um, you know now? Yeah, I think I know the basics. Uh, we know all the details, I guess, of technology, which are again. But you know, you can, you can. Uh, uh, you know how a television works because you understand the physics inside. Um, or well, do you? Is it like pre, uh, um, comparing it to the the laws of physics? Well, the the you know the, the TV or any simple machine, well, or any machine, uh, even simpler perhaps. It's better to think about the simpler machine first. You know, it has different parts and they work together. Towards, uh, each part is there for a reason, and and, um, and they work together to to make the machine work, right? Uh, and uh, and well, most of our everyday machines are well. The television is made out of electronic circuits that move currents around, and they do uh, they show the light on the screen and so on, and that. Um, that makes the television work, and you have to understand how that is uh, made. Yeah, but as a child, what was your age that you did that? Did that? Well, maybe when we were, say, I was perhaps from eight to, to 12, we would be doing this thing of uh, <laughs> taking machines apart and putting them together. What did your parents say about that? Don't do it again? Oh, no, my, my dad like liked to do this himself, so... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so taking things apart, you learned from your father. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And what did, you, did your mother my say? Father, about it? No, my mother liked it to have things fixed. So, <laughs> 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 yeah, my dad always liked to fix things. He was very practical, and uh, ah. he liked the challenge of fixing it. And then sometimes you don't know how it works, so it's nice to have to fix something. You don't know exactly how it works, and then you manage to uh, understand how it works. You so when you're it. on the road and your and your your car has a problem, you can fix it. 
Uh, well, I was able to do that in the past. Uh, now cars got more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This car hasn't uh, broken down recently, so I can't oh. uh, tell for sure. But. Uh, so, but it, it started all at the, at the young age, and yeah. and, uh, mm-hmm. and it's almost uh, um, inherited from your father. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and now you are here at Princeton uh, Advanced Studies yeah. Institute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, in a position where you are allowed to uh, think as much as you can. Right, right. I'm a, yeah, I'm encouraged to to think and do research all the time. Uh. So, uh, is it too simple to say that your job is think thinking? Yeah, it's thinking, it's discussing, it's learning what other people are thinking and uh, reading what other people write and trying to make uh, progress, right? And, uh, are you thinking all the time? Um, well, I mean, uh, no. I mean, I'm I'm reading what other people write. I'm uh, I'm listening to other people's ideas and presentations. I'm discussing with uh, my colleagues. Uh, uh, we're, you know, writing formulas and. But can you can, can you decide? Well, now I start thinking, or or does it happen, uh, or how does it work? This thinking process. Well, I guess the the thinking normally uh, you, you you try to these problems sound very vague and grand, but we try to think on very concrete problems where we can make progress, right? So there are the questions that are extremely interesting but almost impossible to solve. There are questions which are perhaps too easy to solve. And we try to be in between. So try to find the most difficult or more interesting question that you can actually say something useful about. And lots of thinking is trying to focus on such questions. Try right? to imagine very simple toy models or simple models where we could um, say something new. So but maybe and a few, few easy answers together might solve a more difficult answer. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's this thing that I was saying before that you do a step at a time. So we have to figure out where yeah. we do the next step. So yeah. the next step is in something some something we more or less know but moves us in the right direction uh, from which we can get a better view for what the next step would be. Um, so when do, when do you do your, your best thinking? Um, well, I, I think during the day and uh, maybe... Uh, it's not that you are, when you are out, for example, when you are outside, or when you uh, <laughs> no, shower? No, no it's, when, mostly, when, it's mostly, when, I would say, in my office, talking to other people. Uh, normally, when you talk to other people, you, uh, you, well, you get uh, new ideas, and usually, many times, new ideas come together in this. Uh, but then, this the, then those colleagues are are gone, and then you have to write down the idea, or do you have to? Well, to many times materialize we, write them toge- we, write, we, we write them together, and we we certainly write. Uh, articles with other people and, hmm. and this is important I mean most of my articles are with other people so oh of course with yes. other collaborators yes, so. yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's once someone said from it's hard to sit it's harder to uh, it, it, well it, it's hard to sit and not to think mm-hmm. it's so hard to to shut down your thinking mm-hmm. is, is it how do you think about that um, well, certainly you, you, I'm, I guess you, you have to be a little bit obsessive sometimes to work on these problems because you want to think about this problem and you have to ignore other things. I mean, it's easy to get distracted and think about something else uh, when you're not making progress. So if you're trying to solve a problem and you're not making pro- progress, uh, it's, it's easy to get distracted. But sometimes you need to keep trying uh, to find solutions to that problem you initially set out to do and be slightly obsessive about it. And, and then you can make some progress. And you are obsessive? Slightly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when there's something distractive, what, what, is, the, what is your distraction? Uh, well, I mean, it could be someone, some other interesting idea in some other slightly different field. Or uh, I mean, sometimes it's good to be distracted. Maybe the problem you're trying to solve was not was bad, and mm. so it's uh, yeah. balanced. Yes. So, um, if if the, the, well, you can say that this is what you're good at, and you do you uh, you made progress and you uh, solutions or answers. Mm-hmm. Is there also an area um, which in, in which you are unable to find the answers? And 
the 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 opposite the the opposite of your uh, talent. Um, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Fashion. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, you cannot describe that into one equation. Or, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, but I mean, in 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 your in your character, uh, you are obsessive for finding answers in in this uh, theoretical uh, mm-hmm. field. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also when you find it, you can write it down in one line, and then right, and then it's right, true. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, un- unlike political laws, with all the kinds of. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what 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 is what is the area well, I mean, when in which you write down? I, I think the process is not that you write down a formula and it is true, right? So normally in physics, the process is that for some physical theory to be true, it has to be compared to experiment. I'm sorry. So, yes, uh, I answered. So, yeah, what you mean, yeah, yeah, and uh, it, it's checked against the experiment, and then we become more sure that it's probably true. Yeah, uh, there can always be some other experiment that contradicts it, but. Uh, as many experiments agree with it, you you feel more and more confident. Yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry yeah, to yeah. say that. Uh, <laughs> then I say it, then it's yeah, true. But, but uh, then at least I mean, well, in they if, agree if, on it. Yeah, many times you. I mean, a lot of our work sometimes is to derive equation, derive some mathematical relations, like. Um, and and the, the reason for this that some of our work is, ma- is mathematics is because the the laws of physics are are written in this mathematical language and and. Sometimes uh, even uh, laws which are in principle simple, like these uh, equations of Einstein, which are simple to write down, uh, but they're very difficult to solve. So uh, you need either computers and with some ingenious yeah. ideas to solve the equations. And, and But once you find, for example, a solution of the equation, you can check that it is a solution. So And then it becomes a true solution. So that's an example where... Yeah, yeah I understand. Uh, and, yeah. and that's a... But that's you could say well it's mathematics right it's uh, within the so if you assume the equations are the correct description of physics this is a solution of equations. Uh, so so uh, um, and correct me if I'm wrong but but mathematics is like an instrument for you to yeah understand yeah. The, yeah. Uh, what you need to understand what you want to understand exactly yeah so before we were talking about the language in which these laws are written and this is a language that is uh, fairly mathematical. Yes. And so you need to know enough mathematics to be able to understand the. Yes. So, uh, but I can language. imagine that this mathematics, d- you are talented for under, yep. for for using it. Uh, it's it's a it's a way to 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 look to look around you and and uh, follow your obsession. Yep. Uh, but there are also very much a, a lot of areas in which mathematics just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. So then, d- you. Um, which uh, which areas are that that you cannot use math? Well, there are many areas of our everyday life where we don't necessarily we, we don't use math. I don't know if I want to learn the piano. I mean, math is not very useful. Uh, <laughs> or if I want to play soccer, I don't know. Learn to play soccer better. Math is not very useful. You just have to practice playing soccer, right? Um, so, or if I want to cook better, my lunch lunch or cook a nice meal, math is also not very useful. Uh, so there are lots of areas, but um, so what, what are the, the things you are not good at? Uh, I don't know, playing soccer and <laughs> sports. <laughs> um, do, but do you like it? I do it sometimes. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 is that an is that an uh, an um, aspect of mathematics as well that you can like it? If I, if I like mathematics because of some aspect, well, I like some aspects of mathematics because it's, uh, well, it first it's a nice tool to describe physics and and I, I, I certainly like it. It's, it's interesting. Mm. And, um, and well, mathematics is also a subject on its own that is huge. I know a little bit of mathematics and I try to learn the mathematics that I think would be useful for this problem. Uh, yeah. And... Um, Sometimes uh, people need to learn, uh, invent some new mathematics to, um, to, to, to solve this problem. Yeah. Well, but I, for, for example, I'm, I'm much more comfortable mm-hmm. when I talk to people trying to understand people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not comfortable when I talk with other people about mathematics. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I, 
it's not my it's not right, my right, thing or my right, talent right, or, right, or right. so um, uh, I I choose the things in which I'm comfortable and right. that's what I'm doing right now right, I'm right, filming interviewing right, people right, right, trying right. to how does that that person uh, uh, work how, how Right. Well, that, that's yeah, that's true. I mean, we all choose. We all know what our strengths are, and we try to to do an activity where uh, we can really use our talents, right? And, uh, and yeah, suddenly I would be a very bad interviewer. <laughs> know what the other person is thinking, or <laughs> try to guess it. But um, uh, yeah, we all do these various talents. Just our natural. Well, or we develop certain talents, and I guess through the path of our lives, we continue to develop them. Developing yeah. them and we get better at that, those yeah. sub uh, areas, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Anna told me about uh, yeah. the, 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 because I don't want to forget that one. Two, uh, two stories you told about the, the mountain and the, and the, mm -hmm. the valley. Yeah. And uh, about Romeo and Juliet. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, is it? Um, is it? Do you think it's interesting to tell that? It's for for understanding your uh, your theory. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the story about the mountain and the valley was. Uh, that that uh, if you are in, uh, live in a mountain or in a valley. Yeah, and you find you have no reason to go up on the mountain because you cannot grow. Uh, uh, oh, corn. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This this was. Uh, yeah, I think the original question was uh, where this is useful for anything or what are the technological applications of, uh, of this research or this area yeah. of research. And uh, yeah, I, this, this area of research doesn't have a direct uh, technological application that we know of. Um, so uh, we, we, we do it because we want to know and we want to understand. And an, an analogy is that to think that we we have, let's say, a town that lives in a valley, and you know the valley is f fertile, and they grow corn, and they grow their food in the valley, and there is a nearby mountain, and uh, there are some mountains around in the valley, and someone might decide to go up the mountain just to see what's there. Now the expedition of going up the mountain might be totally useless for growing better corn, or you will not plant anything nice in the mountains, but uh, suddenly going up the mountain might give you a better view of the valley, might. Uh, help you understand where this valley is located and it might allow you to see another valley but this is not guaranteed maybe there are all mountains and there's no other valley um, but uh, it's only part of the curiosity of seeing where we are and to extend the you know the, the frontier to to really understand better where we are sitting in our in the universe yeah and this is one direction in which we can go and certainly that's what we I mean, it's like a mountain that is there, and we're trying to go to the summit and be able to understand. The summit is understanding the Big Bang singularity, so understanding the beginning of the Big Bang. And we'll try to climb this mountain, and all the way. And uh, where are you on the mountain? Uh, well, we don't know, because we don't have a view of the mountain from outside, so we only know that we are climbing. So I think we are confident we are climbing. We are not going down, so <laughs> <laughs> there must be a summit. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, that's a nice one. Uh -huh. 